Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Milestone Church. Let's stand to our feet. It's good to come together in the house of the Lord. Amen. And worship God. Let's glorify our God together. Come on. take a seat. It never grows old celebrating life transformation. Amen. Can we just give the Lord a hand this morning that he loves us. He's for us. We're going to just take a few moments and celebrate some people in our church that have been changed by the power of God. Amen. Good morning, Milestone. This weekend, we got nearly 50 people declaring Jesus is Christ and Lord through water baptism. This morning, we got Ryan Lehman. We're in a series called Grow. I love Ryan. Ryan said just in the last year, he's been married to his wife, Bailey. They're buying their first house, and the same day they sign on their house, they find out they're expecting their first child. Now he's getting baptized. I'd say that's growing for sure. Ryan, are you fully committed to following Jesus for the rest of your life? Yes, I am. All right, Ryan. Because of your profession of faith, 
I baptize you, my brother, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Good job, Ryan. Next, we have Bryce. Bryce Devlin. Come on, Bryce. I love Bryce. Bryce got into our FPU, our Financial Peace University, now in men's groups. Now he's getting baptized, just getting connected, really growing here at Milestone. Bryce, are you fully committed to following Jesus for the rest of your life? Yes. All right, Bryce. Because of your profession of faith, I baptize you, my brother, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. That's awesome, brother. Next, we have Yawanda Adelatoy. Edit Loy. I'm getting it. I'm getting it. Edit Loy. This is Yawanda. Yawanda, are you fully committed to following Jesus for the rest of your life? Yes, I am. All right, Yawanda. Because of your profession of faith, I baptize you, my sister, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Good job. Church, this is Kareem Jackson. Kareem watched his best friend get baptized last week, and now he's getting baptized this week here at Milestone. Kareem, are you fully committed to following Jesus for the rest of your life? Yes. All right, Kareem. Because of your profession of faith, I baptize you, my brother, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Good job, buddy. Next, we have Candy Beck. All right, Candy. There's a familiar scream out there, maybe. <laughs> All right, Candy, are you fully committed to following Jesus for the rest of your life? Yes, I am. All right, Candy. Because of your profession of faith, I baptize you, my sister, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Great job. Dominique Maupin. Dominique is a firefighter in Dallas. His wife, himself, and their children are getting baptized this morning all together. It's awesome. Dominique, are you fully committed to following Jesus for the rest of your life? Yes. All right. Dominique, because of your profession of faith, I baptize you, my brother, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Dominique's wife, Sissy. All right, ready to go. It feels good, doesn't it? A lot better than cold, I promise. <laughs> All right, Sissy, are you fully committed to following Jesus for the rest of your life? Yes. All right, Sissy. Sissy, because of your profession of faith, I baptize you, my sister, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Congratulations. This is Madison, their daughter. Madison, are you, let's go this way. Better this way. Are you fully committed to following Jesus for the rest of your life? Yes. All right, Madison. Because of your profession of faith, I baptize you, my sister, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Great job, Madison. Yeah, Madison's brother Chase, good looking young man right here. Chase, are you fully committed to following Jesus for the rest of your life? Yes. All right, Chase. Because of your profession of faith, I baptize you, my brother, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Good job, Chase. Church, would you pray with me? Father, we thank you, Lord, for this morning. God, we thank you for the opportunity to gather in your name. God, we thank you, Lord, for the lives that have been changed and transformed by your grace. We thank you for the vision of reaching people and building lives. May we continue, Lord, to see more and more families, more and more individuals declaring you as Christ and King. God, we love you and we worship you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Isn't that incredible to see such life transformation happening in our church? Church, would you stand back up with us this morning? Let's just continue to worship our God. Let's just celebrate who he is, what he's done. Let's sing out to him today. We love you, Jesus. There's no one like you, God. Sing this out. Blessed 
your presence. We thank you for your love that's poured out for us on the cross. Lord Jesus, we want to hear from you today. We thank you that your word says that your name is a strong tower that we can run to and be safe. God, we thank you today for the name of Jesus that's strong, that's powerful. Lord, we look to you, God. We lean in to know more of you today, to know more of your heart, God. It's in Jesus' name that we pray, amen, amen. Well, you can go ahead and be seated this morning. I wanna take just a quick second, just welcome you here to Milestone Church. If this is your first time here, we just wanna extend a special welcome to you. We're gonna continue to worship this morning through a time of giving. So I'm gonna invite the ushers to begin to make your way down front. If this is your first time with us today, I just wanna draw your attention to that little white communication card right there in the seat back in front of you. If you'll grab that card, fill it out. You may not quite have time right now before the offerings pass, but sometime in the service, just fill that card out for us. And at the end of the service, you can drop that off in one of our giving boxes as you exit the auditorium. And if you'll give us that card, it just helps us kind of connect with you and help you grow with us at your own pace. And we'd love to send you a gift in the mail and just get you some more information about our church, all right? Well, let's pray over this offering. Jesus, we love you. We thank you for who you are. We thank Thank you for your sacrifice. We thank you that you so freely give to us, Lord. And so out of obedience and with a cheerful heart, we give to you, Lord. We love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I'm Victoria, and I just want to take a second to let you know about some things coming up for you and your family around here. Well, here at Milestone, we've got a few simple steps that we really encourage you to take as you jump in and get involved, and we call it our growth track. The first step in our growth track is Discovery 101. It's for anyone who wants to learn about the history, vision, and values of our church, and it's coming in just a few weeks on Sunday, September 13th during the 12.30 p.m. service. The second step is Dream Team 201, and this short one-hour class is for anyone who wants to discover some of your unique gifts so you can jump in and start serving with us. Dream Team 201 is coming up on Sunday, September 20th, also during the 12.30 p.m. service. We wanna help you take your next step here at Milestone, whatever that may be. So check out our website for more details or to register for any of these growth track events. Milestone Stewardship Ministry is so excited to offer one of the most popular stewardship studies in the country, Dave Ramsey's Financial Peace University. This nine week class combines large group video teaching and small group application and connection with others. Using the principles taught in the class will help you get out of debt, save, give, and set up a budget. Financial Peace University starts up on Tuesday, September 15th. For more information or to register, visit the events page online. Ladies, are you looking for a place to connect and grow? Then join us for Flourish, our monthly women's gathering and Bible study. It's a time for you to take a break from your day, grab your girlfriends, and be encouraged as we grow together in all that God has for us. Flourish is happening this Wednesday, September 2nd, from 12 p.m. to 1 p.m. at our Keller campus. Lunch is available for $7 and childcare is provided free of charge. We look forward to seeing you there. For more information about anything you've heard today, connect with us online for quick updates on what's going on around here. Thanks again for being with us this weekend. You know, we went through a season when we looked around us and there wasn't much community with people our own age. It's like we went to church, came home, went to church, and came home. Tons of people were around us, but we didn't know any of them. We hosted our first small group at a friend's house and absolutely loved it. And at the time, our home wasn't really set up for small group. We didn't have the space. We had the opportunity to build our house. I was able to design it with small groups in mind. With our living area and our kitchen 
and a play area for the kids so that we could host families like us who had small children and felt like they had a place where they could go and their kids were wanted as much as they were. Small groups are just a huge part of our life. to the second week of our fall series where we're talking about something that if you spend any time around this spiritual family, you're going to see that it's something that we really value. We, we value not only reaching people, reaching people that are far from God, but we also value building lives, building people. And over the last several years, one of the greatest joys is to watch as people begin to grow into all that God has called them to be. Uh, it's always exciting to see these people that are getting baptized. What a great next step for growth. Isn't it amazing? We can't clap enough. I love when friends yell out and scream their name and clap, and there's little posses and sections over there. Yeah, it's just awesome. I mean, I just love how you get excited about it because I promise you, God gets excited about it. God's excited about these people going public with their faith. Another thing that we love here. Uh, one of our core values is development, and we value relationships. And so this is the time of year where we give you the opportunity to plug into small groups. And so we try to make that simple. We have an online portal. We have, over the next few weeks, you're going to see in the foyer, uh, if you need someone just to chat with you and talk with you about the availability of groups, uh, we would love to do so. You could email us at info at Milestone Church. I promise you, our small groups team and our connection team, they would love to personally serve you any way that they possibly can because if you're going to grow into all that God's called you to be, you have to get connected. You just do. You have to get connected into some relationships. And so if you're looking for that next step, I encourage you uh, to take it here with small groups, all right? Well, if you have your Bibles, turn with me this weekend to Luke chapter 15. Luke chapter 15, whether you've spent any time reading the Bible or you've never read the Bible, is a simple chapter, and it shows us so many profound things about our God. It shows us who he really is. And so as we're thinking about grow and growth and spiritual growth, in fact, some of you may not have had a chance to join us last week, but I kicked this off in talking about how we love every part of our life. We, we want growth. We're, we're at a season right now. It's the fall. And so we're, we're at a season where we're planning our fall calendars and our kids are getting back in school. And so we're looking toward areas of our life to grow. How many of you want your finances to grow. Everybody here, how many of you want your retirement to grow, right? We're hoping Wall Street will help us out with that, all right? We want our vacation days to grow. We learned last week that we want our kids to grow. Now, we say things like, I don't ever want you to grow up, but we do want them to grow up, do we not? We want them to grow up and get a job and support our retirement. Come on, parents, y'all with me? <clears throat> we want them to help us out. How many of you are good at growing like plants and roses and things like that? Anybody good at that? Look, there's so many powerful people. Brandy and I, we have a black thumb. We just do, you know. I mean, and, and, and my wife is so good at growing children and growing women and all of that, and God bless her. Neither one of us are good at growing plants. She'll buy a new one and bring it home, and as it walks by me, she walks by me with it, I look, I think that thing is headed for a funeral. You know, it's just, we set it out there. Come on, you got great intentions when you set it on the back porch, but we're not going to water it. We're not, you know. We're busy people. We're chasing kids, you know, so it's, it's headed for death, you know. And um, a few years ago, I was paying some guys in my neighborhood, some high school guys that had a little lawn mowing business. They were mowing my yard, 
And, and I was perfectly okay with it. It was awesome. I'd give them some money. They'd mow. They'd edge. They'd kind of look over my, my, my shrubs and different things. And my wife one day came to me and she said, Honey, I feel like our kids could learn. They could get entitled if they don't learn how to do yard work. I said, okay, honey, I think that'd be great. Okay, I didn't really want to do it, let's be honest. you know. But for my marriage, I said, okay, honey, we need to, for my kids' well-being, we don't want them to be entitled. So we started with something we called Family Yard Day. Now, Family Yard Day has turned into Me and Mom Day. Because there's just like, everybody's, it's like a ghost town when it comes time to mow the yard. I was mowing the yard this week, and you know, I was just thinking, I was just thinking about the fact we're trying to keep our kids from being entitled, and I realized that I'm probably the one who was entitled, and I'm okay with it. Come on now, are you with me? All right. <laughs> but, but anyway, I've also had to, we had to keep the, the yard, and then all these plants and shrubs. We got some mulch, and there was poison ivy in it, and I've learned about all kinds of little chemicals because we're trying to keep the good stuff growing and the bad stuff dead. So I have poison ivy spray and I've learned about miracle Grow, and we've got rose bush treatment because now our roses have some kind of virus on them. And come on, this is just, yeah. <laughs> I tell you though, I love growing people. Obviously it's God who grows people, but as a pastor, I love watching the bad things die in people's life and watching the good things grow up and flourish. And over years of working with people, I've, I've seen this happen. I've seen where people will spend years in church and never grow spiritually. Is that not amazing? Just doing the same thing over and over, but never really vitally growing. That's amazing that that can happen, but it does happen. I've seen people who are in church or around God for just a short period of time that just explode in growth. They just get, I mean, it's amazing. They just explode with growth. And, and I began to think about that in this series. What are, what are some ways we can accentuate that? And, and not just temporarily. How many of you have ever had a little phase maybe where it's like, man, I feel like I'm growing, but what happened? Where did that go? Where, where did that go? What, you've seen some people who really take off and they start growing. You're like, what, what's gotten into you? You're a different person and we don't want it to be a phase. We want it to last long term. I believe this weekend, through a simple story, whether you've spent any time in the Bible or not, it's a simple story that can show you some truths about God. Because here's what I want you to see. Long-lasting growth comes from knowing who God really is. Not a preacher's opinion about God, not your friend's opinion, not necessarily even the church you've been around or been through. or any, It's not a program. It's, it's knowing who he really is can create long, sustained growth in your life. This parable that Jesus tells. Now, he tells three parables here in Luke chapter 15. They're all related to the heart of God. I always love to give you the context because the context is who's Jesus really talking to? Because that's why I'm trying to help you learn how to read the Bible. When we know who he's talking to, then we can listen to him talk and see why he accentuates certain things in these stories. And so he's talking about lost things, and he's talking about his passion to find, God's passion to find things that are lost or missing their way along the way. He's talking here to a crowd of people that has all different categories. Last week we talked about a Pharisee. We talked about a tax collector. They're listening to this story. The religious one who's trying to do everything right to perform, to keep everything all in order and get God to love them, they're, they're there. The tax collector who's cheating people, and they're, they're there. There's a crowd of people that are probably just looking on, trying to understand what Jesus is saying. So really the truth is this passage speaks to all of us today. If you've heard this parable, then it still speaks to you. It shows you something profound about who God really is. If you've never heard it, you're going to get a simple understanding, a profound, powerful, simple story that can help you understand who God really is. Let's read it. It's a little bit long, and I want to walk us through it together. Jesus continued. He said, there was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of your estate. Give me my share of the estate. And now right off the bat, we see something very powerful. This, this family has some dysfunction. 
There's some problems between this father and this son. You're going to find out there's problems with the father and the other son as well, both sons. So, so right off the bat, it gives us some hope. I'm not asking for a show of hands, but how many of you have some problems around your life, your family, some parental expectations maybe that you didn't met, some parents that didn't meet your expectations, some sibling challenges because of parental involvement, all kinds of things. Aren't you glad that Jesus right here off the bat says, I know where you live. I know some things going on in your life. I understand it. Now, we don't get the power of this because we don't understand the culture Jesus is speaking to. This literally for this young son to come and say, give me my share of the estate. It was supposed to go to the older brother and he was to manage the family, but this would literally be like this young son saying, I wish you were dead. The disrespect. I want to say right off the bat, I've ministered recently, the last several months, it seems like this has just been a recurring theme from some of the places that I've spoke to even people in our church. People that have a child that has treated them this way. That said, look, I don't need you. What They may not have asked for their inheritance, but they're a prodigal. They're a, a son or a daughter away from God. One weekend, I said, I'm praying for prodigals. I'm praying for people with children away from God. And, and I had a, a guy come up in one of the early services and say, here's my child's picture. Will you pray for it, Pastor Jeff? And I took that picture and I said, yeah, I'll pray for it. And then I mentioned it in some other services. By the end of the weekend, I had a pocket full of pictures. Nothing pains a parent like having a kid that's gone the wrong way. It's almost as if I could go through anything, my own personal bankruptcy. I could go through my own personal challenge. Anything could come against me. I don't really want it. But when it's with my kids, it pains me at the deepest level. Some of you maybe here are that son or daughter with God, with your natural family, and you're that one who's away. And I just want you to know it hurts the heart of God. It hurts your parents. It hurts the people that love you. It hurts them deeply. Just make sure we really understand how painful it is right here at the beginning. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, and he set off for a distant country, and there he squandered his wealth in wild living. I always think about this in the story. I wonder who agreed with him along the way. How many of you know when you go the wrong way, at every turn you will find someone to agree with you when you're walking away from God? Don't take that as God's approval when you're walking away. And there's always going to be somebody there who's trapped in their own misery, in their own sin, and they want you to join them so they're going to agree with what you're doing. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country, and he began to be in need. How many of you know we all end up at a place where we recognize our need? So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to his fields to feed the pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. And then it says in verse 17, this is what every person here who's praying for a child that's away from God, this is what every person here, this is what God's desire is for you. Every person has a friend that's going the wrong way. This is what the prayer is. And I join you this weekend in praying for those people, and I join the heart of God for you if you're in that place. It says, when he came to his senses... Man, I wish I could figure out how to make that happen. Anybody with me? It's like, I wish I could be God and go, wake up. <clears throat> you ever been in that place where you come to your senses, you have the aha moment, and you go, this is crazy. Why am I doing that? He said, how many of my father's hired servants have food to spare, and here I am starving to death. My sin's just not treating me near as good as my dad's hired servants have it. I'll set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you, and I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up, and he went to his father. Took a lot of courage. Number one thing that holds us back when we're away from God is, how will I be received by God? How will I be received by those people that have been praying for me? And we build up all kinds of things in our head about how they're going to treat us and what it's going to feel like, and it's not ever going to be the same. And so all of that emotion, the enemy keeps us trapped. Nonetheless, this young man said, I'm going back to my father. I'm going back. But this story is not just about the son or the sons. The main theme of this story is back to what I'm trying to get you to see, which will create long-lasting growth. The story is about God our Father. 
It's about the father. Look what it says. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him. He was filled with compassion. He ran to his son. He threw his arms around him, all of which is undignified action for a man of his stature. And he kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe, put it on him. Put a ring on his finger, sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. And this is the essence of the message that Jesus brings to us. This is the life of Jesus in a nutshell. Look what he says. For this son of mine was dead and now is alive again. The message of biblical Christianity is not to reform people, not to bring performance, not to bring some type of religious activity. It's to take people that are dead in their trespasses and sins and make them alive again in Christ. He was lost and now he's found. So they began to celebrate. Meanwhile, here's the older son, the Pharisees sitting out there probably, again, they're, they're, they're thinking, oh no, he's picking on us again. When he came near the house, he heard music and dancing, so he called one of the servants and asked him what was going on. Your brother has come, he replied, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. The father even goes out to the religious one, to the one who has his own opinion about his own righteousness. He goes to him too. And he answered his father and said, Look, all these years I've been slaving for you. Notice the words that the Bible used. I've been slaving for you. I've been doing what is right. I've been trying to keep all the right standards. I've been slaving for you. You never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours, who has squandered your property with prostitutes, comes home, you killed the fatted calf for him. My son, the father said, you are always with me. Now let's have a little grace for the older brother too because he was there watching his parents cry while the younger son was out living wildly. Yet he did not even himself understand the love his father had for him as well. Listen to what he says. Everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and now he's alive again. He was lost and now he is found. What does this passage say to all of us? You say, Jeff, you're talking about a motivation. Here's what I know as a pastor. When I start talking about growth, people start thinking, can you tell me the steps? Can you tell me the formula? Can you tell me the plan? And we create steps here at Milestone Church. I was ministering to a guy the other day. He was concerned about crowns in heaven. And he said, Jeff, can you just tell me, man, because he was a type A. I just want to win at this, man. I'm going to have more crowns. I'm going to have the mansion. You know, I don't want to be in the cheap seats. And I'm like, dude, you're missing it. You're missing it. The crown is Jesus. You, you don't understand who Jesus really is. Here's what I know. If you think formula, if you think steps, you won't last. You won't last. Nothing wrong with some steps. But I need to deal with the motivation. We're going to deal with barriers. We're going to deal with some practical things throughout this series. But here at the beginning, we're trying to break through the facade of our culture and help us get to the heart Get to the place of where our real motivation comes from because we're going to do what we want to do. We have to deal with the motivation. So this story deals with the deepest, and I'm going to be honest with you, a little bit painful area of life for us because it's dealing with something that, again, culturally is a great challenge to us. Let me try to break it down very quickly before I pray for you. Three areas where we can look at lasting motivation from this story. Number one... What Jesus is saying to us through this story is he says all growth in our life spiritually that can be sustained starts with a right view of God. Now I need to give you some passages to back up these premises that I'm making from the story. I need to show you a little holistically from the Bible because again, Jesus did what he did based on his view of his father. His father said, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. Why do we know God wants to love us and does love us because of the way he loves Jesus? And because when we love Jesus, then we have that connection to our God. So Jesus lived this way, and Jesus then transferred something to his disciples on one occasion. His occasion this occasion was he was always praying. He was taking these little breaks and moving off to the side and fellowshipping with his father. And one day his disciples came to him and they said, 
Can you teach us how to connect with God? Can you teach us how to pray? Can you teach us what you know, Jesus? And this is a famous prayer that many of you have prayed and you may not have gotten the implication of it. Jesus in Luke chapter 11 says, when you pray, you need to pray, Father, our Father. Now, some of you grew up in religious circles where you, our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come. And you know that rote prayer, but you're not getting the implication. This was a major moment in human history. For hundreds, thousands of years, God was only righteous judge. God was only distant, angry, reactionary at some level. Some rever- they only knew him that way. And Jesus said, look, because of my life now, I'm changing the way you connect with God. I want you to pray this way. Our Father which art in heaven. Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. And you may know the way we pray it. Our Father which art in heaven. Hallowed be your name. Thy kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. The way it is in heaven, the connection level, the intimacy, make it that way here on earth. The message paraphrase. When you pray, say, Father, reveal who you are. Set the world right. Set my world right. Now, right off the bat, again, if I could just go a little bit deeper into our motivations, this is a challenge It was a challenge for them because of the brokenness in culture and the brokenness in families, and it's a major challenge today. I'm not doing this for shock value. I'm not trying to manipulate you. I'm simply doing what I should do as a pastor, deal with your motivation challenges to grow, and it comes from that word father is a loaded word in our world today. Just some simple stats. Just think about the Father. Some simple, basic stats. 71%. I mean, there was a whole list of them. I just picked out a few. High school dropouts, they come from fatherless homes. It's nine times the average. There's a nine time greater likelihood that they're going to drop out of school if they have a fatherless home. Look at this next one. Runaways, homeless young people come from fatherless homes. 32 times the average. And this is one of the most stunning statistics. 43% today in our world, 43% of children in the U.S. live without their dad. It's the highest level it's ever been in American history. So when we see that, we all start doing an evaluation. We start thinking, well, wait a minute, my dad and how was my relationship there? You may have not had that relationship. You may have had a dad that was angry, that was passive, that was abusive, that was distant, that was more concerned with work than they were with you. I, I don't know, a whole host. Others of us who are dads, we start evaluating ourselves. Man, man, we're so key in this. This is big. You know, it's like, how am I doing? And here's the facts. We're all frail. We all make mistakes. I'm so glad the Bible's transparent with us and gives us a story that says we cannot be the completion of everything in the lives of our children, though we should endeavor by the heart of God to do that and take that responsibility. The fact is, where the Bible takes us and where Jesus takes us is beyond our human experience. And he takes us to a place where we can really deal with that fatherless issue, that wound that we have, that pain that we have, And this is why Jesus gives us this story to say that we can have God as our Father, our Father. By the way, when you see those stats, many of you know I love single moms, and you could see that and say, well, that's that's a stat. It's just a a reference point to where our culture is. It doesn't have to be a prediction of your child's future. That's why at Milestone, we don't just believe in just building an auditorium of people listening to messages, why we want to get people connected, and why we build spiritual family, and why we have men in this church taking young boys of single moms to baseball games, because we think in the church there can be a restoration of the picture of what Jesus' heart is. Make it right, Jesus. Make it right in our world today, as it is in heaven, Jesus, through us. Do something only you can do. You know, in my own world, I had a great dad. He obviously, just like I, had weaknesses and inadequacies. Primarily, your view of God comes through the lens of your earthly father and also authority figures. I learned that my dad brought a lot of character and a lot of things in my life, but even some things about his upbringing and even some things about the church I grew up in, because you get a lot, too, from the church you grow up in. And so... Uh, Over the last even five, six years, God's been doing something even in me regarding what I'm talking to you about. Long-term growth, long-term motivation, not based on external circumstances or performance. 
church I grew up in, maybe like some of yours, I, I'm so thankful they taught me to fear God. I'm so thankful they taught me about salvation, but um, it, it, it wasn't, in some ways, the, the relational connection to God was not always emphasized. You know, we didn't have movie mania and popcorn. Come on, parents, that's what your kids are getting today. We didn't even get goldfish. We sat on the pew. Y'all remember those pews? You got a cushioned chair. We sat on a pew. And you had to pay attention. And, and my earliest recollections of, here's who God is. Again, it taught me to fear God, taught me to get right with God, and probably the reason I got saved, because I didn't want to go to hell. But every revival preacher, every person that came through, when they came to a spiritual moment to model God to us, it was like there was a car crash. Or I remember one vivid experience. This guy, he came, man, he was sweating and preaching and yelling and told this story about a guy in an airplane that crashed it into the mountain and it caught on fire and if he didn't know Jesus you know you could crash into the mountain and you'd be like why does everybody have to die in all these stories come on everybody and it's kind of like it scared us out of hell you know what I'm saying and I, I'm, I'm telling you that's not a place we want to go but but we didn't always get taught how to have that intimate personal relationship. When you study the generations, thank God for the great generation. We could use some character traits from the greatest generation that went through the Great Depression and World War II. Thank God for those. But yet, how many of you know we all see in part, and there was some things missing about God really loving us outside of our good character traits. God loving us, the intimate personal connection and relationship. And what happens is, based on that, again, if you have that as a model, maybe through authority figures or, or in your own home sometimes, you just don't know how to really receive from a father that loves you like that. Here's the second thing you need to know. This is what these, all three parables in Luke 15, and this one hits it big, and that is God places incredible value on you. Outside of your performance, God places incredible value. When you see God the Father this way, when you receive the person Jesus Christ, look at this verse right here out of the book of Romans. i got to keep giving you these so I can reinforce what I'm trying to tell you. When you receive Jesus, the Holy Spirit comes inside of you. You receive, does not make you slaves anymore. Remember the older brother, I've been slaving for you. I've been doing everything you told me to do so that you live in fear again. That view of God keeps you living always in an unhealthy fear of God and very little relational connection to that God. Rather, the spirit you receive brought about your adoption to sonship, to daughtership to sons and daughters, brought you to that place, and by him we cry, Abba, Father. Now, some people have just minimized this down to just the word, they say, what does Abba mean? To just the word daddy. It can mean that, but it's not just age-specific. The concept here is a term of intimate connection and endearment. You know, some of you, you, again, you called your grandfather Papa, or you, my grandfather, we called him Da, because the, the first grandchild couldn't say the whole granddad. They said Da, so we called him that. It, it's really not just, because sometimes people disconnect with just the terminology, Daddy. You know, it's like, what does that mean? Here's the principle it's saying. It's an endearment, it's a connection, it's a relational intimacy that you've been brought into. Much different than the way we define ourselves. Here's what you need to get. Your growth long-term is understanding what fathers do is they define. What fathers do is they build environments so that you can grow and develop. And when you come into a relationship with Jesus through this loving Father, He gives you a new name. He gives you a new identity. He gives you a new perception even of yourself. I was thinking this week, instead of seeing ourselves as those that are adopted as sons and daughters of God, we have a greater propensity to define ourselves in a different way. One of the biggest ones, and this has just been on my heart, is unworthy. So many people don't see their value. I see, I, I love young people, and I see young people take their life off track. And many times it's because they think, look, my parents don't value me. I don't have any coaches that value me. I don't have any friends that really care about me. I don't even matter. I, I, they've been taught in school that they're not really created in the image of God, that they're just some kind of just thing that came out of some organic soup. I'm just some happenstance. I'm, just, I'm, not, per, I'm not personally valuable to God. But you see, when you come into that adoption, when you come into that sonship, when you get that new name, you move from unworthy to being worthy because of how he defines you. Here's another one. Insignificant. 
I, I, I don't matter. No one sees me. Parents, let me give you this. A lot of times rebellion is you don't see me. You don't see me. So I'm going to show you how you'll start focusing on me. I'm insignificant. I don't matter. That's why every young person, I want to be famous. I want to be somebody important. That's why they do all kinds of crazy things because they're just trying to get somebody to validate that I'm important and I matter and I mean something. If that's you, let me say this. No amount of external stimuli will ever make you feel validated. It's only when you recognize you're a son and a daughter of Jesus Christ. Look at this, the next one, the third one, guilt and shame. So many people, the guilt, the shame, where I've been, what I've done has put me in a position that I can never get back to God. I can't, I can't grow again. And we get so trapped by letting those mistakes define us that we don't keep moving toward the Father, and we stay in that place. But Jesus says to us, we're forgiven slaves and move to a place of being sons and daughters of the King. I want to say this to you, by the way, too. You have not only the personal ability to see yourself this way, but there's some of you, even, you're like, man, Jeff, I don't want to dig that up. Can we just shut that door, those father wounds that I have in my life, that stuff that you don't realize it, it's what's fueling a lot of your activity that's leading you down the wrong path. Jeff, just keep it shut. Well, I don't want to keep it shut. But what, when, you, when you see it, now you understand this, even in its most perfect sense, can't provide what I really long for. And then you're able to receive that new name. I am validated. I am significant. I am worthy because of my heavenly Father. And let me tell you something real powerful. If you feel like you haven't lived up to the expectation of your parents, or your parents just fell asleep at the wheel and did not parent you, let me give you something powerful. You have the ability to forgive them because you're rich in validation and love by your heavenly Father. I'm going to say that again. In fact, I've been waiting all week to say that. I really have. I've been waiting all week. Let's, we close the service now. Some of you are like, amen. Let's beat the Baptist down there to the restaurant. But anyway, okay. I'm say that again. Jeff, you don't understand. I just wanted their approval. And that, see, you go one of two ways. You either hurt yourself and ruin your life because you're in rebellion or you try to live your life to perform to get enough trophies to get them to say, you matter. You do one of two. Either one's a dead end. And you're sitting there going, but this is reality, Jeff. This is really what they did. Well, all of us have weaknesses and there's scales of how bad it was. But regardless, when you receive the affirmation of a father, you're so rich. You're so filled with so much of the goodness of God you can offer to them, and here's what will happen. You'll begin to see why they related to you the way they did because they didn't know their identity in the Father either. They didn't know it. So you now have the ability to offer something that is crazy. It doesn't even make sense, but it's so real in you, you have the ability to offer it. Here's the final one, number three. Lasting growth comes from living in the Father's lavish, abundant, undeserved love. Love is the motivator. Love is what compels us. Love is what brings us the goodness of God. You're like, Jeff, I just don't know why I don't have the power to change. Well, it's because you don't know how much God loves you. Because the Bible says it's the goodness of God that leads you to repentance. The word repentance means change. When you see the goodness, this party that was thrown for this young man is a party you never want to leave. When you go to that party, that's a party you never want to leave. And so there's this undeserved, overwhelming. Look at this verse. I love this verse. See what great love the Father has lavished on us. Just given us a little bit. Just given us enough to perform more. No, he's lavished on us that we should be called the children of God. And that is what we are. I wanted you to, yeah, that's a great place to clap. Yeah, it'll encourage me anyway. I uh, asked our team this week, and uh, you know, we're just, this, these, a Bible story that's so simple for you to be able to get, but I asked our team, I said, I, 
I want, I want everyone that listens to this message, because it's such an issue in our culture, I want, I want, I want to show it as many ways as I can. I, I want to use statistics. I want to use the Bible. I want to, and the Bible is sufficient to communicate it. But I said, I, I just want people to really come in contact with how much God loves them. As a, as a young pastor, I started when I was 20 and uh, got a few performance issues myself. And uh, I, I, would, I would preach and I would, I would leave a lot of times discouraged because I'd be like, Jesus, I was trying to do good for you. And, 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 and no one responded or people, maybe sometimes people would be saved or maybe sometimes people wouldn't be saved. And I just remember those first several years of preaching every weekend and working through my own emotions and my own challenges and I did this when I was in my early 20s, and, and I'll tell you, I've, I've done it multiple times since. You, you know, you're, you're, trying to, you're trying to get you in contact with a God who loves you. That's what you're doing as a preacher. Use this thing, the foolishness of preaching. It's trying to, trying to get the connection to happen. I just asked Jesus, I said, Jesus, what do, you, what do I tell them? Could you give me something to say? And so clear, as if I, out of just a few times, I've heard the clear voice of God he would always say, Jeff, just tell them I love them. Make sure they know how much I love them. There's been multiple times through years of preaching. I say, Lord, I, I'm struggling with the content. I'm struggling with, just make sure when they leave, they know I loved them. And I love them so much, I sent my son and made it possible for them to have a relationship with me. I want you to see the Father's love through this modern story of the parable that I just read to you. since we talked, I was, you know, I was kind of hoping you'd answer, but um, you know, I understand that you probably don't want to talk to me. I've just gone so far, and the things I've done, I, I just regret it, you know? And I know how bad I've hurt you and let you down, but, but Dad, I, I miss you. I miss how we drive around and just talk about life. And I just, I just want to come home. But I know you've probably written me off. I can't blame you, actually. Here's, here's, here's the thing. <laughs> it's kind of a shot in the dark, but I'm, uh, I'm coming through town soon, and to see you. I know I can't just show up at the front door like I used to, but but if you want to see me, just hang a small sheet out on the porch. And if the sheet isn't there, when I drive by, I'll keep going and, and I'll try not to bother you anymore. I love you, Dad.
ask you to bow your heads with me. I'm going to ask you a simple question. Do you know that, Father? I'm not asking you the picture you have that maybe has been painted through authority figures or maybe that's been painted through even your religious experience. Do you know Do you know that Father? Do you know Him through the person Jesus Christ? Jesus has made it possible for you to have a relationship with that Father. He took the sin, He took the guilt, He he took the shame, the pain, made it possible for you to have a relationship with that God who loves you deeply. Say, Jeff, what do I do? Well, it's really simple. It's really about just yielding and surrendering your heart right where you are, you can do that. You can just say, and make it your prayer, make it your words, not my words. You can just simply say, Jesus, right where you are between you and him, Jesus, come into my life. I I know I've missed the mark. I know that I've messed it up. I know I'm a long way from you. But I recognize it. And it's not fulfilling, Jesus. It's not really bringing significance and hope and happiness and life and joy to, to me. And so I, I ask you to, you to take that and you to deal with that. And Jesus, I want you to come into my life. I believe that you died for me, that you rose from the dead. And I want you to become my Jesus, become my personal Lord and Savior. Not a statue, not a figment of my imagination, but I want you to become my personal Jesus, my Lord, my Savior, and I want to grow and walk with you in Jesus' name. I'm going to ask you to keep your heads bowed. I'm not going to embarrass you. I'm not going to make you come stand up or anything. I just simply want to get a tool in your hands that when we dismiss, you can you can get this tool. And if you say, Jeff, I prayed that prayer a minute with you, would you just slip your hand up, every head bowed? Would you pray for those that have prayed this? Slip it up. Just just raise it so that the ushers can see it. I'm just giving you a card. If you'll just slip it up and let them know, they'll give you the card. Thank you. Anyone else? Just slip it up wherever you're at. Anyone else? Just just slip it up. I want to also talk to a second group of people, and you say, Jeff, I've prayed that prayer, but I'm not in an intimate relationship. I, I am the prodigal. I'm the one that's been running from God, but I want to come back home. I want to come back to Him. Would you just slip your hand up and get a card for me as well? You say, I want to come back, Jeff. I, 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 you may have done multiple religious things. You say, Jeff, I want to come back. Just slip your hand up. I want to give you this card so that you can start to grow right here. Just get just, just right there, sir. Right there is her hand. Right, right in front of you. Make sure you already got one. Okay. Anyone else? Anyone else? Okay. Father, I pray for people, prodigals, people running from you, coming back home to you this weekend. Father, I pray for all of us, no matter where we are, that we would grow not on the bed. You love us in our person and who we are, not our performance, not our activity, not our religious duties. You love us. Let that love change us. Let that love just compel us to walk with you and to grow into all that you've called us to be. In Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand on your feet? I'm going to ask our ushers to come forward. I mean, our our ministry team to come forward. Ministry team, just make your way down here. I'm going to ask Pastor Mike and uh, Pastor Eddie Guerra to go over here to this table. Um, We had a lady baptized last night who came forward last week, gave us a card, got a Bible last week, and she was baptized last night. That's always so exciting. We had uh, four or five people give their life to Christ last night. Uh, Would you just do that? I'm trying to make it simple. I'm trying to help you get a connection. These pastors are there to answer questions. If you just got a card from me, as we start dismissing, make your way right over here underneath the screen. They have a gift from me to you, a Bible. I'm going to ask you to start in the book of John so that you can start growing in your faith. Um, These ministry team leaders are here to pray for you. If you have anything going on in your life, that's one of the powerful things about church and spiritual family is we can stand with one another and bear one another's burdens. And I'm just praying that every one of you get connected in a small group so that you can start growing into all that God has for you. God bless you. Let's let that love carry us this week. Amen. Let's let it carry us. All right. God bless you. We'll see you next week. You come.